right, hello once again from the Ronald Reagan Minuteman Missile State Historic Site. My name is Rob, I'm the site supervisor out here, and today we're going to talk a little bit about bomb shelters. Normally we like to talk about Cold War missile systems like Minuteman Missile that was once deployed out here in eastern North Dakota. It still is out there in western North Dakota around Minot Air Force Base. But it's March 2022, if you're looking at this in the future. Uh, there's a lot going on in the news cycle right now, and uh, the term nuclear has re-emerged into the news and when that happens we sometimes get phone calls or questions on social media regarding nuclear weapons or the um, necessity of bomb shelters where bomb shelters might be located near us and um, basically there's a lot of history here behind civil defense in the united states during the cold war period there's a lot of opinions about the uh, ability to survive uh, nuclear attacks so you have on one side basically saying, whoa, I don't think we're going to survive this. You're probably going to die if there's a nuclear attack. All the way to this Pollyanna, hey, I'm going to duck underneath my desk. Um, I'm going to survive that nuclear fireball about 500 yards away from me. I'm going to come out tomorrow and it's going to be all puppy dogs and sunshine. In reality, you're looking more towards, well, let's say, the middle. But it, there again, it depends on the measure of the attack, the size of the attack, and what's really going on. Um, you know, you're looking at the 1980s. Both arsenals of the superpowers have uh, thousands of nuclear weapons, and uh, basically if a wide-scale war would break out, it was going to be a bad day. Uh, there was a lot of nasty things that could occur with a large-scale nuclear attack. But there's also the possibility of limited nuclear attacks or um, nuclear terrorism that should be considered as well. So, I mean, there's basically a lot of myths about radiation out there, a lot of myths about how duck and cover and fallout shelters were going to protect you, and we're going to look into that a little bit today. So, just love some of the imagery here of, you know, your back backyard bomb shelter that um, some folks were building back in the late 1950s and 1960s, but it was very much across the board. Um, it was very much an evolution of understanding how to best protect the U.S. public over the years. And we're going to look at the changes that went about and basically how it got kind of confusing after a while. So there's a lot of cool artwork with the civil defense pamphlets that came out, a lot of color, a lot of ways to hopefully stem some fears and, uh, you know, try to calm the hopelessness about the ability to outlive a nuclear war. And essentially, there was a lot of good-spirited effort, especially in the 1950s and 60s, that said, hey, we can do something to at least save lives. You know, there's the long-term implications we're going to have to deal with, but initially, hey, let's just get people sheltered away from that nasty radiation, and then we can deal with the post-war environment after that. At the same time, you have um, parts of American society that are looking at some of this stuff and basically saying, hey, this is propaganda. I'm not sure we're going to be able to outlive an H-bomb dropping on a target zone about a mile away from me. And uh, there were certain elements that came about in art, in music, in um, films and television that kind of questioned the morality of uh, the shelter concept, but also questioned the ability to live through a nuclear conflict. So there again, a lot of myths and a lot of things to take into consideration when it comes to nuclear weapons. I'm not sure if you can see him too well back here, but we got good old Bert the Turtle down here, um, kind of one of the more infamous uh, cartoons of the Cold War period, advocating that school children could survive a nearby nuclear attack by ducking under the desk. And, you know, in reality, there is um, some benefit to ducking away from debris and, uh, you know, broken glass, things of that nature. And that goes across the board, whether it's a nuclear weapon uh, detonating nearby or tornadoes or earthquakes, for that matter. And you'll see over the years that civil defense really starts to broaden their horizons away from nuclear conflict to, you know, working with hurricane uh, mitigation all the way to the Federal Emergency Management Agency as we know it today. So we're going to go back to 1951. Um, the Soviets detonate their first atomic bomb, a copy of our Mark III design um, that was detonated over uh, Nagasaki, known as the Fat Man Bomb. Uh, by 1949, they have that. By 1950, you have the Korean War um, breaking out in uh, the Korean Peninsula. And you start to kind of feel that, hey, you know, the Russians have the A-bomb. 
Um, there's the Red Menace going on right now at the time, kind of the uh, some of the spy trials. Uh, you got a war in Korea. You got some uh, conflict, possibly, you know, uh, in you know Berlin after the Berlin Crisis of 1948. Not so much uh, conflict, but tension. Are we starting to see the signs of a new World War III? Um, what can we do to prepare for this war? We, we've learned a little bit about atomic bombs from 1945, but what do they really mean in the context of civil defense and warfare? So in 1951, Our Cities Must Fight, this is a very interesting film. You go into it, and the big push here is mass evacuation of cities just doesn't work. You need to stay on the production line, you need to stay at your essential job and help the war effort even though atomic bombs are falling on your city. Um, it's interesting too that the phrase or the term treason comes up a f more than a few times in this film, basically saying, hey, if you run for the hills, that's treasonous and uh, you need to stay here and again, help the war effort. The deal is they have some knowledge of the atomic bomb at this point. They're seeing the devastation of Hiroshima. They're seeing that uh, blast uh, and fire can wreak a lot of havoc and uh, did uh, during Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, you're learning a little bit more about radiation at this time, but essentially civil defense is painting the atomic bomb as, you know, we should worry about it, but it's not as horribly scary as people are making it out to be. And we need to be able to fight a war with these things exploding in our cities. So there again, you have a lot of misunderstanding at that point. Um, you have some details of radiation effects, uh, sickness and death coming from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but they're also contrasting Hiroshima with American cities and how well you know we could tolerate being attacked. Hiroshima was a community very much built uh, a great deal of wooden structures. Um, the bomb hit at 8, uh, 16, I believe, 8, 16 in the morning. Uh, there was a lot of cooking fires that got knocked down by the blast. Uh, the resultant firestorm that is covered a little, you know, it's covered in history, but it's not as well remarked, is that, you know, you have the atomic bomb going off, um, you have a lot of fire starting, but then you have a resultant firestorm that causes a lot of deaths as well. Um, a lot of people underneath uh, crushed buildings, um, unfortunately, are caught up in that firestorm, and then you start to see the latent effects of radiation uh, poisoning, um, you know, in the hours, days, and weeks after the attack. So here is that, you know, we got to keep fighting um, even with this going on. And at the same year, you have Bert the Turtle, 1951, advocating for school children to duck underneath desks. If you're out having a picnic with your family, make sure to throw that sheet over yourself to make sure you're, you know, avoiding the flash burn, although you might be too late in that regard. Um, a lot of things that look kind of questionable today, but it was a thought process as far as trying to calm a public uh, from those nuclear fears. So you have 51, the pre-H-bomb era, and then... There again, some of these tactics are useful. I mean, ducking underneath a, a desk is you know, it's just a good idea if you have nowhere else to go immediately, um, whether it be a nuclear blast, because you don't know where that's coming from, or a tornado, um, and then just protecting yourself from flying debris. But also, we have a lot to learn yet at this time about um, radiation as far as the, the general public is concerned. So Ivy Mike, 1952, the next year, you have a 10.4 megaton blast, 770 Hiroshima's, Civil defense is stepping back and wondering, I'm not sure how we can protect people in this point, at that point. Um, you know, something that powerful, uh, blast shelters are ex uh, very expensive at that time. Uh, they still are. Uh, just trying to protect a general population from a target zone is extremely difficult to do. So the Soviet H-bomb is coming along by 1955 and Civil defense is just trying to figure out how best we can protect citizens and our cities and target zones. So, very quickly, by 1955, you have evacuating cities. We learned that evacuating cities was potentially treasonous in 1951, but very much shifts the other way by 1955. The thought was the American uh, defense um, basically is deploying early warning radars at this time. They have a growing fleet of interceptors 
and we can tell that Soviet bombers are coming in several hours out. So we get the warning several hours away. People calmly evacuate the cities and go out to the countryside, hopefully to be greeted with uh, food and hugs from rural areas. Not sure how well that was going to work. We'll look into more of that by the 1980s. But the evacuation concept um, really got into play in the mid-1950s. They we can't protect you in the target zone, so you're going to have to leave the target zone as calmly and as orderly as you can. So you got a day called X in 1957, uh, interestingly the same year as Sputnik, where uh, Portland, Oregon has a civil defense exercise where non-essential uh, people are evacuated out to the countryside. They leave in essential uh, personnel to run you know, utilities, the fire department, the police department in there, but it's a way to protect the populace uh, from that nuclear attack. So sometimes you'd see these evacuation routes. I mean, these are very common down south um, near uh, coastal areas with hurricanes um, and then out west on your coastlines with tsunamis. But they also once had evacuation routes for the possibility of nuclear attack. So that was 1957 of the day called X. Um, we're going back to 1954 and the Castle Bravo explosion out there in the South Pacific uh, America's largest nuclear test and unfortunately America's worst radiological disaster because this was a predicted yield of maybe five to seven megatons. It went well beyond that into 15 megatons. Um, the weather conditions uh, were not favorable and you started to see nuclear fallout being spread over U.S. Navy ships. Everybody has to basically take cover underneath the deck, under, under the desk, a uh, desk, a uh, desk possibly too, I guess. Um, but uh, Pacific Islanders are getting uh, dusted with this deadly fallout, dangerous fallout, and um, unfortunately a, uh, a Japanese fishing crew gets dusted with a heavy amount of fallout. Um, one of the uh, persons on that ship die um, indirectly from radiation exposure. So very quickly you see the term fallout coming into the lexicon, and it's a whole new um, problem there again that civil defense has to deal with. Not only you have target zone issues with fireballs and blast and fire, you have resultant fallout that can spread hundreds of miles downwind and uh, injure, possibly kill uh, many people in its wake. So we gotta find a way to protect people from nuclear fallout. 1957, you have Sputnik, H-bombs on missiles. All of a sudden that bomber threat is still there, but the warning time drops from hours to possibly 30 minutes, and that's by the 1980s. Um, in 1957, there really wasn't a good way to detect incoming missiles, but then again, the Soviets didn't have an operational ICBM fleet, uh, actually for a few years beyond that. But you're looking at the ballistic missile early warning system being deployed in 1961. That might give the United States 15 minutes warning, and you certainly can't get out of a city with 15 minutes of warning. Back to the drawing board for civil defense. Fallout protection um, becomes the predominant uh, concept in the late 1950s. You start to see a few more uh, pamphlets and films consult, you know, concerning how to best protect yourself from fallout. And the general idea here is find a good basement, put a lot of concrete, put a lot of dirt, put a lead if you can find it, uh, around and between you and that radiation and hopefully that will screen out a lot of that danger. So that's the difference between like a blast shelter and a fallout shelter is that a blast shelter is basically what we have here. Four to seven foot thick concrete walls, um, independent electrical uh, generation, you have shock isolators to protect everything from a nuclear blast nearby, and a uh, kind of a, a ventilation system to help clean out contaminants. A fallout shelter, all that really normally was, was a designated area underneath um, a tough building, a concrete reinforced building, um, basically a basement that could be stocked with some supplies and you can write out that nuclear fallout for how many ever days or possibly weeks that it's dangerous outside. So at the same time, um, you have growing public concerns about nuclear fallout, especially from those atmospheric nuclear tests. Nivel shoots on the beach comes out, um, I believe 1959, they make a movie very quickly thereafter. Um, not gonna give away the plot line, but it's uh, very, say depressing. Um, survivors trying to deal with 
that imminent threat of death coming from nuclear fallout. Uh, you see Alas Babylon around the same time, which also considers fallout as a deadly hazard that the characters have to overcome. So you start to see a few more protests, um, especially against um, nuclear testing, and that brings us into the Kennedy administration. So here we are, uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev here. Um, the crises that occurred during the early 1960s, you have the Cuban Missile Crisis of 62, the Berlin Crisis of 61. Uh, July of 61, Kennedy's looking at the situation and saying, we need to request more money for civil defense. We need to get fallout shelters marked. And uh, when you look at this in a historical context, there's a lot of politics involved, honestly, um, but general ways to help calm public fears of nuclear conflict. So they're starting to stock the shelters. Um, I actually have one of these drums I found at an antique store um, that could be filled with water, uh, later could be converted into a toilet. They did have sanitation kits as well. Some food, uh, usually uh, crackers that had a very bland taste, if at all. Um, we've heard people refer to them as tasting like cardboard, but it was a way to keep you fed for two weeks in shelter. And they really advocated for you to bring your own canned food and non-perishables uh, to these shelters so you can amend the diets here. Um, some radiation detecting equipment, we got ours here. Good old Civil Defense logo there. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, as well as medical kits and uh, dosimeters, ways to you know make that uh, shelter life a little more tolerable so you don't have to starve or be thirsty. Here again, at the same time, you have um, a lot of other factors coming into play in American culture. Uh, of course, we got Dr. Strangelove here uh, with that mine shaft gap of trying to keep a population um, living for 93 years after a nuclear attack due to concepts of what's called salting nuclear weapons, um, making them a lot more dirty, it was called, uh, to cause long-term radiation effects, um, and not just strontium-90, iodine-131, and cesium say 131, just basically the radioactive isotopes that are longer lived in the environment. This one's talking about anything that's on the surface is basically going to be dead. So you better get into that mine shaft and interesting concept. Over here we have a screenshot of the episode of uh, the uh, Twilight Zone called The Shelter. Basically this uh, neighborhood is very cordial. Everyone's getting along with everybody. One of the neighbors builds a bomb shelter. Uh, word gets out, and there's an imminent threat of nuclear strike. Neighbors start going crazy and trying to break into the bomb shelter to protect themselves as well. It's, it's a big um, you know, thought on morality, um, how we would behave with the imminent threat of death, basically. And uh, there was a lot of talk in 1961, um, even with religious leaders, about morality at the shelter door. How do I protect my family, but how do I protect my community from that threat of radiation and death? So, you know, it's, it's an unpleasant conversation that people are having, but by 1963, you're getting out of the crisis years. Um, basically, there's a lot of attention now being paid towards uh, the limited test ban treaty of 63, I should mention. Um, you have some alleviation of the superpower um, confrontation there, as well as the uh, Moscow to Washington hotline. So there's some effort being made towards avoiding nuclear war. But the Vietnam War is right on our doorstep, and basically attentions shift away from civil defense very quickly by 1965-66. Appropriations really start to drop off, and they head into some lean years. Um, there's still shelters being identified. They get some stocks continually going, at least into the late 1960s, but civil defense all of a sudden is very much gearing now towards um, protection from hurricanes, like Hurricane Camille in 19, uh, I believe, 69, and then earthquakes, things of that nature. So in the 1970s, um, they're starting to reconsider relocation and evacuation uh, once more. Now, the thought is, hey, if there's going to be a nuclear conflict, it's a good chance this is going to be preceded by times of tension or little indicators that are going to say uh, nuclear forces are getting warmed up. We need to get out of the cities and away from those target zones. Uh, this map here, CRP uh, 2B, I believe it came from. It was a uh, civil defense uh, planning guide for 
protecting the population against nuclear attack. And I'm not sure if you could see it from that phone there, but there's a lot of black dots there. And I think Oscar Zero is pretty much right here, so uh, not a good chance for survival in this location when the site was active, at least according to this map. But outside of target zones anyway, you're going to have a heck of a lot of fallout. Um, you know, if it was a mass nuclear attack, the Soviets had an uh, increasingly large ICBM capability in the 1970s into the 1980s. Um, both sides have very large arsenals. I mean, we peak out in 1967 with uh, 30,000 nuclear warheads, weapons. Uh, the Soviets, late 1980s with about 45,000 nuclear weapons. But there again, it gets an idea of relocation. Um, there's a lot of issues here. Uh, they're actually putting guides in phone books saying, hey, you, we have host areas, they're called, that will welcome you with, uh, you know, open arms once you evacuate the cities. They're going to have plenty of food, plenty of water, and plenty of housing to protect you during that crisis environment. And hey, if we do have a nuclear attack, we're going to start burying buildings with a lot of dirt to make sure, the, um, you know, you can protect yourself from that nuclear fallout. Here's the problem. You're, you're shifting a lot of people from one culture in a city uh, to rural areas and social classes were just gonna be inevitable. Um, you know, if you're in a small town, you have a certain amount of resources, all of a sudden you get overwhelmed with basically nuclear refugees. It's hard to say how um, Americans, or anybody for that matter, were going to react um, in ways to, you know, defend the community or um, try and protect and help as many people survive as possible. Uh, just uh, support systems were going to be uh, possibly very overwhelmed. And here again, you have a lot of hopelessness in the face of a massive nuclear attack, especially when you see something on that scale against American targets. I mean, they're even taking out Sioux Falls. What's in Sioux Falls? Oh, they have an airport, I guess. Minneapolis isn't looking too good. It looks like they're getting hit by seven nukes. But the missile fields here, too, you know, we're up here in North Dakota. A lot of that nuclear fallout going east, and it uh, wasn't going to be a good day. 1989, the Cold War's ending. Um, uh, you've got Reagan and uh, Gorbachev there. Um, some of the arms agreements going on in the late 1980s to lower those arsenals. Um, you start to see dismantlement of nuclear weapons on both sides. And you see here from these peak years of nuclear deployment, everything's really starting to fall down by 2010, but there's still many thousands of nuclear weapons um, on both sides and by other powers as well. So today, you know, these fallout shelter signs are getting few and far between. Um, if you go to shelter, there's stories from the 1970s basically saying, well, we do have food resources down there, but the mice are getting into them. Everything's starting to get rancid. Uh, things are rusting we're probably just gonna throw most of this away. And that's what happened in New York City. I mean, they were trying to give away the food, no one would take it, so they finally had to take it all to the dump. Um, so if you see a place that's still marked as a fallout shelter, um, if it's the same you know, construction as the 1960s, it was identified for radiation protection then, it st still probably is pretty protective for radiation, but just don't expect any blast doors or independent oxygen supplies or even food down there. It's gonna be a basement more than likely and more than likely a storage area. Um, and here again, we'll just say other disasters outside of nuclear war, they're much, much, much more likely. Um, we're getting into tornado season. Uh, they had some tornadoes down there in Texas uh, last night. And, uh, you know, you have floods, power outages. What you need to have for a nuclear conflict um, could be kind of the same as you'd have for a power outage or a blizzard up here few days of water, some food supplies, a way to charge your phone, a way to keep warm, things of that nature. It's just uh, practical preparedness that most of us as Americans uh, can face uh, dated, um, you know, on a daily basis, earthquakes in California, tornadoes in Texas, and blizzards up here in North Dakota. Um, hopefully not too many more. It's March. It's getting warmer, but still don't know. We still have a blizzard coming in. Catches by April. Um, some sources for information, if you want to learn more about uh, protecting yourself against nuclear effects, ready.gov is a great site uh, put out by the Federal Emergency Management Agency about what you need to do in the uh, possibility of, you know, a nuclear explosion, but also uh, many other disasters out there. It's a, it's a great guide. Uh, Redcross.org has some resources as well. 
CDC.gov gives a little bit more information about radiation uh, problems and sickness and trying to get away from some of those myths as far as, you know, how radiation affects the human body and um, just ways to possibly mitigate those risks. So here again, March 2022, um, I'm sure we'll see the term nuclear come up in the news again and again and again over our lifetimes. Um, they say it was something like a sword of Damocles that is uh, hung over our heads basically since the late 1940s. And uh, the nice thing here is that, you know, this is a decommissioned missile site. Um, it performed its mission of nuclear deterrence. We still have missile leaders out in the field, Minot, Montana, down there in Wyoming, Nebraska, Colorado, that are still at their consoles, 24-hour basis, 24-hour alert, to continue that method of nuclear deterrence. So, um, interesting world out there, but there's a lot we can learn about protection and a lot we can learn about history, and we encourage you to do that here at Oscar Zero. So, once more from the Ronald Reagan Minuteman Missile State Historic Site, my name is Rob, and we'll catch you next time.